Welcome everybody. Welcome ladies and gentlemen to our Irish language seminar tonight. My name is Natalie Nugent O'Shea. I'm the executive director of the Celtic Junction Arts Center, uh, which is bringing you this program. And in here, you can see I am in the beautiful Owen McKiernan Library. Uh, the library is one of our programs with Celtic Junction Arts Center. The other three are the Irish College of Minnesota, the concert series, and of course our outreach programming. We bring you uh, this program by virtue of all of them coming together. It is my pleasure to uh, welcome you to an exciting evening and to tell you a little bit about how it will go. Uh, what we'll begin with is a presentation by the lovely Lavinia Finnerty. We will move on to a panel discussion with Lavinia and include Irish language speakers and instructors, Fenton Moore, and Nancy Stenson. Uh, and at the end, of course, we will welcome your questions and comments. So um, get ready to put your Irish on. Um, but first, we have this lovely exhibition um, due to a generous loan from the Consul General of the Midwest. So in order to kick off this event, it is my great pleasure to introduce Miss Sarah Keating, Vice Consul General. Good evening. Dear you've got dinner. To Anna Ahersar, I'm very kind of enough. I'm delighted to join you to introduce tonight's presentation. Sir Kinney Caden is Anam Dom, August Tom in my last consul, egg on our consul of Naheran in Chicago. My name is Sarah Keating, and I'm the current vice consul at Ireland's Consulate General in Chicago. Although I cannot be with you in person this evening, I'm delighted to have been asked to be a part of this event. I studied the Irish language in university and during that time was lucky enough to complete an internship with Conor Nguelga and the teaching and celebration of the Irish language is something that remains very close to my heart today. As you will hear throughout the evening, in 2018 Conor Nguelga celebrated its 125th anniversary and a bilingual exhibition was developed in celebration of this. We've been delighted to share this exhibition with our cultural and academic partners across the Midwest and it has now happily found its way to a new home at the Celtic Junction Arts Centre in St. Paul. The, the exhibition celebrates one of the core purposes of Conor Naguelga, the revival or Osguelga at Fiocan of the Irish language through culture, community and much more. When sitting down to begin the revival over 125 years ago, I wonder if the founders could have foreseen that over a century later, the Irish language would be thought as far away as Minnesota in the Midwest of the US, and indeed even further afield today. The work being done by Lavinia and others at Celtic Junction in teaching and celebrating the Irish language goes straight to the heart of what Conor Naguelga aimed to achieve. The Irish language plays such an important role in Irish culture, and it is inspiring to see it being embraced more today, both at home and by our diaspora throughout the world. A special thank you to Natalie O'Shea for inviting me to be a part of tonight's event and to Lavinia Finnerty for both her presentation this evening and her work in keeping the Irish language alive and well in the Midwest. I hope you all enjoy what I'm sure will be a fantastic presentation. Garv Magat agus Ihoak Gakdina. Thank you so much, Sarah, for your generous words and uh, for your recognition of the center here. Um, now, of course, it's my pleasure to introduce you to one of my um, favorite people in this world. She's one of the instructors in the Irish language here at the Irish College of Minnesota. She has brought the TEG program to our shores. We're one of the few places that actually hosts that Irish language certification through the University of Maynooth. Um, the chair of our department and native of Connemara, Ireland, Miss Lavinia Finnerty. Gurumi Lamahad and Ashley, August Gurumi Lamahad Horacha, to all in Huekal. Thank you very, very much, Natalie, for those kind words. And Sarah, it's lovely to see you again. Thank you, of course. And everybody's very welcome here tonight. Um, so tonight we're going to look at and that is the revival of the Irish language. And we are grateful to Conrad Nguelga who put this 
presentation together and who are kind enough to share it with us. Um, so now let's talk about Evoch on the Royal Gear. August Tigger or Evoch on the Royal Gear Tastal at Dossach and why the need for Evoch on the Royal Gear came about to begin with. So, what we're going to do is we're going to go back in time. Go home with Shir Kofa Delishadari Hishzig. And we will go back to the 12th century to the arrival of Strongbow in 1169. August Maradermut Samale. Hug dear mother Machmarho Koroho hacked Achnir Yorkshire. So, um, dear mother Machmarho actually invited Strongbow to Ireland, but as we say at home, he was invited, but he never left, he never went back home. Marshin Itter on Dara Hish Zig, August and Shaktu Hish Zig, V. Achran Itter, um. Vi akran idzer tishi na hayden agas na sasani ak ni ro tunkor tunkor olwar erenzang erenzang erenzanga. Um, so now between the 12th century and the and the and the 17th century, although there were um challenges and difficulties and between our tishi tishi between tishi na hayden, um. And the chieftains of, um, between the chieftains of Ireland and the English, it didn't really have a huge impact on the language. That is, the the language shift that actually the greatest language shift began to occur, actually in the 17th century. So this is when we look at um, the 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 language shift that really occurred. So what happened? So so shaktu hish zig, kung on the ruddy bavasa har the nuhani Cranwell, nu Oliver Cranwell mar hoktarad, agus tigin was galier on meza dorche to hell or to connoct. So Oliver Cranwell is well known in Ireland for saying to hell or to con to hell or to connoct. So what's one of the things he brought? Well, one of the things that came in the 17th century were the penal laws or the pains lihem or hugan was or hugan oilge. Agus, be honig skults, skults nismas nu maravion idzer and dari hishtig is in shock to hishtig. Agus, um, Agus is so honig on the plant all is each in ishta. So the plantations all occurred and Cranwell and his army were really um, ruthless in carrying out um, their orders for, uh, plant and creating the plantations in Ireland. And of course, the, or the, it came, the saying he had was go to hell or to Connacht. So if you were not willing to change and to go under the model of the English model, the colonizers model of becoming a Protestant and speaking English and following that particular way, you were sent either to hell or to Connacht. And actually that was one of the, really that was the beginning of the larger um, language shift. And of course, a, a larger language shift had yet to come in the 18th century. Now, although we had the, pay, the, the penal laws, people were challenging them, okay? But the, the change of language had started to come and people were speaking English in, on, in the land. Now, as we see here on the left of this, on, here on the screen, um, you can see Daniel O'Connell. And Daniel O'Connell, um, he stood up for the Irish people and he fought against the penal laws. August Rinisha An Upper Elyeshin and he was successful in 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 Fuskels Nagatilacha in the Catholic emancipation which came in 1827. However, if we look at Daniel O'Connell a bit more critically um, regarding the language, when Daniel O'Connell, a man that was born in Kerry and a place where Irish was a stronghold, of course, and today still is, never mind then. Um, really, when you look at him, and he went around Ireland 
but he did not communicate with the people of Ireland through Irish. He had a translator communicating for him. So the famous speech he gave in County Clare, he gave that in English to an audience who spoke in Irish. So you have to think of the language shift that had occurred for that to happen. So when people like Daniel O'Connell were buying into the um, into the mindset that the Irish language was not good enough, this is where one of the he's one of the more predominant characters in Irish politics at the time, and he has bought into that, and he's fighting for rights of the of the Irish people. So. Um, and and he did achieve those and and gosh we can only uh, um, think about what all of the people went through at that time, but ilia ongelge honic afro tango allwar is we share shin um, shin rod allwar a horle ilia tango gora on mion shin taki agus on mion shin lin and yov na huil on tango soch ma. Hon um Nahulan Tango Sok Mail High Kursi Dlias Kursi um Eknamiok Agasarella. So that whole mindset that the Irish language wasn't good enough for politics, that the Irish language wasn't good enough for economics, it had to take a second place to the English language. That is something we still struggle with today. Um we struggle, I'll give you an example. For for me growing up as a child, um you know, I would have heard of things like, well, if you go by past the bridge, Ken Wahoti, Mahinto Harrods Rahots, Mahinto Harrods Ak Dota, Ken Wahoti. If you go past Mount Cross, Peacocks of Mount Cross, what good is it to you? Because it's only English out there. And so the influence of negativity did not just come from abroad. The Irish people in the in the English speaking regions had bought into this. That English, that Irish was a second class language. And this was a quite a huge factor. And that came from this from the 17th and from the 18th and 19th century, really. Um, so um, then to add to matters, of course, we had the Honic and Gertha Moore, we had the Great Famine. And um, and I say great famine as in the large famine, not that it, there was anything wonderful about it with the mass, mass um, immigration and, and death that occurred. And we can only imagine what the people went through at this time. I mean, the psychological, social and emotional um, effects this has is really tremendous on the country and on the people, not to mention the people of, the, of that time. Now, um, no other European country went through such a change at this time. Really, they didn't. To see our Honic Mel Ashtok or Dane Renitida, it's around Thomson. And this all fed in, this decline in population had fed in to the whole narrative that what good is Irish to you when immigration is our answer? to getting out is the answer. So getting out, and of course, when you're getting out, you're heading for America, you're heading where English is spoken, you're heading away from Ireland, away from the language. And so the whole ethos that Cranwell had was to hell or to Connacht. Um, if you spoke Irish, you were considered a second class citizen. You weren't, you're, it had um, a status, it had, that, there, there was a lower status associated with that. And Kid Fari or War She Shin could the unfehuish, Agasok Zernox Fehuish. And unfortunately this mindset stayed with us till the 20th century. And I dread to say the 21st century in some instances. Thankfully, this attitude is not as prevalent today. And we will go through this process as to how we've came here. Um, but the question must be asked, why the acquisition of the English language meant an overwhelming abandonment of the Irish? So came for Fragmud's Ardanga Hain on the Squimud's Berle. If we look at Europe and we look at other countries, they have not neglected their own language 
when they learn English. It is possible. Agus Maris all going is fader lin, hoilge is berla lords. Agus go hang, gunu three hang, gunu kede hang of egdena. So a person can be bilingual or trilingual, a person can speak many languages. We don't have to abandon one to get the other. But in the words of Sean Dufresne, it is only by seeing it as a millennial or a utopian movement that the flight from the Irish language becomes explicable. Kegor Honik Ma or in Tanga, Higdini Oriha, Gorhasta Avochon, Agus Gorhasta or Vigor Orhu Rodikinzi Yona, Ilya Tanga, Kunia Hawat. So even though the decline had happened in the language, people understood something needed to be done. And that is where we get the um, vision for revival. New fish avochana. Shin not the best at Danikshe, on maids shin of it horly. So from what from what had preceded it, people understood something was needed to be done. And in fairness, they have great work was done in the 19th century and a number of organizations, Irish language organizations were set up. Now think that this was done at a time when speaking Irish was not even permitted. So to get these um, might seem like, it might seem like very little today, but actually these were huge achievements at that time. So um, Marhampla is um, in Octeg Octo, um, Bunyu in Tok Norilge, Agus Kur in Tok Norilge, Beam or Litsyok, Agus um, Dials Shield, um, Irishler Misul. So the um, in Tok Norilge, um, actually published the monthly, um, the, the monthly, um, magazine, I suppose, or pamphlet, um, on Love Lower, I suppose, um monthly they sent that out monthly but even though that was going on um people understood and two people in particular on McNeil and Douglas de Hiza, understood that more needed to be done Hig Shieldson Gurun Gur Nak Fader Le Lisyok Shasa Lesh Hain so um Hig the heeds at Xon McNeil, Gorhas the beam a cur or entangled laura. Cain wa litsyacht, Gandini and non yallowers. Cain wa litsyacht. And actually, that's a debate we had recently in the Kel in, in the Owen McKiernan Library and, and with a number of our, our students in the Celtic Junction that, you know, um, literature versus speaking and it's a very interesting debate it's it's the chicken and egg scenario but for a language to survive kafir e allowers i guess hig maridort my hig macneil agus de hiza eshin hig shit goragó le shitang allowers marshin in octig nechatsti dial shishit sinirish largame crinu aku um emiul Agus on crinu shin, se crinu shin, bunyu conrin a railge. Agus shing a fall will muds and shall knocked. So, and therefore in 1893, conrin a was founded because Owen McNeil and Douglas de Hiza understood the importance to do with this with speaking the Irish language. And that's why we're here tonight. And while we're here, we, we um, understand what actually the Hiza and McNeil said. And actually, if we look at, at, at their quotes here, Tanga bin Narwar bo riyav Narwar kursali natuhya. So no language survived that didn't survive by the fireside. And that, I believe that's so true. And it's lovely to see the, the, uh, the language by the fireside here in the Midwest. Um, and this is what Conor and is all about, promoting the language, keeping the language going on. And if we look at what, what the Hiza had to say below, um, um, the Hiza said, um, 
ismule tas gamelishka ledzilna inish nu an khoilge a khonyal galawert agas kredzimsha gulsha shin kofir kofir in yovasivisha no worshan gomsa ta agas kredzim gofolamori is feeds relief fulum on scrive sorella ak molum go khulona and tangalawert so as Douglas de Hedes said, there is nothing more important now than to continue speaking the Irish language. And as I said, I believe that is as important today as it was then for learners of the language and for native speakers of the language. I think that is critical to the survival and, and the development going forward of the language. Zaidil yo. Agus nor hos she de ma, hos she de ma, ni se canter tuchia, ak se canter, um, canter na carhoha, ni a wan in aid in a simlachia, ak a medica is a sassana, agus de warshin honic tunker, um, v tunker, egdini harliar. Erin Tanga, Agus Erin Gunra. So people abroad, they did succeed and thankfully they did. But one of the things that happened was they actually had, they set up um, the Gaelic League, as the Conrad Gaelic is called. They set this up in the city. So in Dublin, but abroad also in, in places like London and in America. And as a result of this, they actually had influence nu tunk tunk is akiot o verica and we're going to look a bit at, at that now but before we go as far as america we're going to stay and look in london and for example norma borthwick it was one of the people who became influenced by the by conra nagoilge so sas nach vienta nira engoilge ke ak is dir gnia khse weimarha is dir gnia kho un konra weimarha london on edition is gerhani shi ge blockli a cybershire son un konra a fa piece ma cybershile le le de hide agus magniel agus nadini vi um uh towards un konra arai so it was obvious that um that that norma brunswick had been um influenced by the Irish language. Now remember, she didn't speak the Irish language, but she had been influenced by what she saw in London, so much so that she ended up in Dublin helping out with the league. So um, when you think of the time now, um, but it's quite interestingly as well that it was an English woman that was able to have this. Was this privilege afforded to an Irish woman at the time? Now there are other topics to that which we will come to later. But um, but it is interesting that the influences which came from abroad, but it was not just from um, from from England. It also came from America. But Queen Nish Nadini of America, August of London, Grub Aidney of Yuntuko could this mo Aidney died a lob harlar, no, um, Dini by Winster lob smile, August, um, Vishit Gira rod the horse of rash. So remember now the people who, a majority of the people who were influenced abroad were actually of Irish descent or were Irish themselves. So Nur Kalu Parico Moylan in the Waurach. Dog she a chuds erigid, hun quidzu le ferberts is dulcon queen, dulcon keen the royalge in Aden. Agus dinu agus the warshin vier conrin a royalge kinyana. Kinhui a machshi the non and the erigid shin usad, a machshi the cur bonu em erroch the ellen no care the villa donaco. Agus and rod a rinishid, one a shid scheme timriachta. So when Parik Mullen died in New York um, and left his money to Conrad Aguil, of course, they had the decision to make what were they going to do with the money. But one of the best decisions they, the Conrad, Conrad Aguil actually done, they actually set up uh, um, on the, the Timory, Shkim the Timory, that was the organizers and the teachers, traveling teachers around the country. Now, this happened at the right time okay because when for things to come together you need the right people to come together and one of those people was actually Thomas 
Bourbon or Concanon. Now, I often tell people if I could go back in time and if I'd like to have a conversation with somebody, who would it be? And it would actually be Thomas Bourbon or Concanon, actually. And um, so, Rugu, Thomas Bourbon, and Inish Mellon, because uh, we seal harvest simulegas. So, a man that was born in in, in Inish Mellon, Oran, um, he was he had a very interesting life and so so i will just look briefly at his life before we go ahead and and look at him mart simran numar munsro gelke so um rugue in or in mar dortma agus norvishene zegor huse gomerica so mar dortma um kredsem gor far harve simul e thomas bono can canon agus um norvishe quick blion the zeg dish Hushe go medica, is your grod zara on the hamahain, agus rinche kunsiot, snolskal, emas emerica. So when he was, he was a very interesting man, I believe, at this time, um, around the age of 15, he went to America. I believe his brother was already there, and he actually done accountancy. Um, he, he actually got a master's in accountancy in, in America at the time. Now, um, and then he ended up selling rubber stamps after that. Um, so think of the time uh, to go, uh, a boy from Inish, more, Inish Milan, Oran, um, to go from, from there to, to America, to go to get a master's in accountancy and then to end up selling rubber stamps. But he went from, he after selling the rubber stamps, he ended up in his brother's vineyard in Livermore in, in California. And actually we have a book about that in the library, which we'll come to later on. But um, he spent a while working with a brother in, in the vineyard in Livermore in California. And he went from there to Mexico. And whilst in Mexico, he got a pamphlet from Conrad Nagelge. So, Queen Nurshin Anish, Gawur Gunyach a pamphlet of Conrad Nagelge called Fadalish. Now, how did he get the Gaelic Leagues pamphlet in Mexico? Was the question. Was the Conrad Nagelge's reached that far, or did somebody mail it to him, or how did that come about? I'm not sure, to be honest. But then, Remember, at the time when he grew up in, in, in Ishmore, um, Oren, um, which we'll talk about the education in a few moments, but, but I, um, education through the medium of Irish was not allowed and it was not acceptable. Now, remember, Thomas Bono can canon be Thauna Railgege, a man, he, he had fantastic Irish. However, he could never read or write it, but he taught himself how to read and write once he received the pamphlet. So think of, of that, of somebody who can pick up a pamphlet and teach themselves how to read and write in, the, in that language. Now, remember, he was able to speak it. But anyways, as we continue on, so um, he was obviously very taken that there was such a thing as the Gaelic League. And, and anyways, he went home to Ireland on holidays. So who shall while go in Ishmael? I guess Norvish is a mile. Who a parik mac pierce called fatherless? It's lower from what's till if we parik mac pierce again pishing. Um. So whilst he was at home on holidays, parik mac pierce went to visit him on in Ishmael, and um, we'll speak more about parik mac pierce in a while. But, um, but having said that, parik mac pierce was influence. Was the one that influenced and coaxed him to join Conrad Aguilge, but his role in Conrad Aguilge was quite interesting because he became the first Simra that Conrad Aguilge had. Now, um, now um, many people have, um, have, have different descriptions about them, but the, remember what was the object of the Timri, they had to go out and meet the community and, and to spread not only the language, but the whole mindset of, and it, it, I suppose in a way it was a bit like, um, this is really where the revival really took place for me in the largest part, because this is where the people goes out spreading the news, you know, of this is possible, we can do this together. And on Cusper Awan, Marekin Woods and Shaw, 
on Cusper one we car room pugolier, no on Ruilge a car a lowers a reach. So the, the, the aim that they all had was to put um, the Irish language out um, for the people to speak again. And to me, Thomas O'Concannon, Thomas Bono O'Concannon answers the question I, I asked earlier um, in our, that we asked earlier about why the acquisition of, of English meant um, abandoning the Irish. Because as we see, as the Clive Solish described, um, an excellent linguist, he speaks Irish and even Spanish much more fluently than English. So he, um, he shows that it was possible to do it all. Um, but and when he was described, when they described him, they said he was described that physical type so characteristic of the islands of Inishman. Um, so that is how they described him. But the job that was ahead of him, I think Norma Broswick described it perfectly when she said, um, it is the experience of the Gaelic League that nothing can be done until that feeling of pride is awakened and that the most practical way of awakening it would be to send a travelling teacher and organisers about the country to stir up a strong public opinion in favour of the language. I think that really sums up what the Timre actually did. And then Timre... Timrocht is organizing. So Timrocht means organizing. And that's exactly what they did as they went around. I guess the um, far on Chreds Thomas Bon Ochenkanen to Schame. Chreds Chayon and Nedichen. Nar nar has the in Erigat Gurikche Ehein Efarovian. Mar, he was, he, he believed that much in it in this scheme that he actually paid himself from his own businesses for the first two years until Conor and Aguilga were able to actually pay him. So imagine having somebody like that that was able to do that. It's quite, it, it's quite, um, quite I, I believe it's quite amazing actually that, that we had somebody like that. Um, and I believe that was one of the really the first, not, not the, the first, but one of the main things at this time that really helped Conrad Aguil get flourish. So as I alluded to earlier, um, he was um, he was physically he was known as um, a physically big man or a physically how did I say it? He was um, he belongs to that physical type so characteristic of the islands, which would have referred to fishermen who were physically strong, but that was needed because he literally had to go around the country and it was a tiresome job um, to do that but before he'd done that that he set up a system of how to win the people over how to how to um, coax um, and to um, teach and educate the people agus vi un chorus sha an thavachtach elia gol e vaim ar dini um Onus Gaval Shedini Lish. Agus Niawan Gerval She Nadini Visha Gol Mon um Golamamuna Akval She Timri Ella Freshen. So not only did he educate others, but he also brought he was um he was quite charismatic and able to bring other um, teachers and organizers with him. So much so that by 1906 there was actually a hundred organizers going around the country. So as you think of it, can you think of anybody in today's life that would remind you to be so charismatic that they could bring people with them um, and to coax them, you know, and to educate them and be understanding. And that was one of the thing about, things about Thomas Bono Concanon. He understood the people because he was one of the people. He wasn't an outsider. Yes, he had been abroad and yes, he had been successful, but he, he understood the mentality of the people and that was instrumental in bringing other organizers along with him um, especially when the work was so challenging you know um, I believe it was Colm O'Guira a, a person who was influenced by not only Park MacBeerish but by Thomas O'Concannon um, he said Colm O'Guira said Bovinic Narbi on all Curtsy River so that was true. It was often he wasn't met with welcome. It was often it was the opposite. Um, 
but he also went on to Colum O'Guira also went on to say, Neil Neil Goyal a mile in the again, nor Hula Trocht or Thomas Bono can canon on third Imra shot I guess them. That really sums it up when he when Colum O'Guira believed that everybody knew of of Thomas Bon Ockenkanen. And I I'm really proud of him in many ways and and I suppose not only proud, but I really would if I was to go back in time, he would be the person I would like to meet. I would love to know, you know, how he did it because he really believed in it. And some of it was lonely work. And when you think of it, it was done at a time when so they were going around as teachers. Now, that brings us to our next topic, our next part, I suppose, of this is education. So they were the first Irish land. They were the first educators um, at, of this time. OK, now I'm not going back to um, so when you think of that, they were the first um, teachers. So now we're going to look at the education and teaching a nation. But now remember, in order to do that, we're kind of going to go back and forth when we do this. So, Queen the Erin Chorus Scullinly. Okay, so the school system that the English set up in 1831 was quite severe, I suppose. It was one of the things they had used to oppress people and people, children had to attend. It was one of the things they used to create the language shift. Um, they, no Irish was allowed in the schools. So remember, children were going to schools, um, learning English. Um, the parents did not always have English at home, but the, this created this whole um, education system which they had created um created um the helped i suppose enhance the language shift which occurred in the 19th century now um as i said the school the english school system was set up in 1831 and no irish language was was allowed to be taught it was all through english but the uh, thomas bond o'concannon i guess and the and the and the um organizers that went around the country with them, they were the first um, people to teach Irish. And remember, this was against the law at the time. Okay, so remember these obstacles that they had. So um, as we go forward, we look at that. So by not including Irish in the educational system set up in 1831, this added, as I've already said, to the mentality that the Irish language wasn't good enough. It wasn't good enough for um, um, for in across the board. So it was the same old story. So Marzermud's on Shan Shgale Kielness Medigad. Near us, boss on Gohifigul Gongailge, Gohifigul Gongailge, Gorsid Zli, Nuan Upper and Realtish, Nuan. So it was the same old story again that the Irish was not good enough in, in it was not a language of business, it was not the language of the law, it was not a language for government. It was, it, it just showed where they ranked the Irish language. Um, but as we've already seen, Conrad Nguilge stood up and they organised the, 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 they organised the, um, the scheme, the Irish language scheme, and 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 that really was was to me that was a huge factor because they were the first ones to stand up to this system. And remember that system I've just described. It was Parik MacPierish that described that as the murder machine. That's what he described it as. In in he, it was published in 1913. And um, he 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 published some of it, but the rest of it was published after his um, his death. And it's a very interesting read. If any of you would like to take a look at that, but car my thought my car kind of a girl can course as a cousin or fall. Is there wrong on the? Is there no colors to save? I guess how's the shit in a legal and a summary? So the kind of a girl did set up their own educational system, and if that came in the form of um the the colors to girl get. Now they are the colors to girl get. Um, I suppose they would be known in states as um summer camps, but they would be the Irish colleges. But um, as as we um, as 
as we look at it, I believe it was um, Mr. Ash who will come to that quote in a moment. But but um, but the, the, I just want to take a moment on the Irish colleges. So these were set up, and the idea behind it that every all teachers would be able to get educated through these Irish colleges, as in they would be by teachers being educated, then they can educate their students. And Thomas Bonk Okankanen was the start of this, and the Timri were the start of this. And uh, uh, and it's actually something that goes on to this day. Now it may become in different forms, and they aren't all led by Conrad Aguilga, although Conrad Aguilga still very much is involved and connected with what's happening on the ground today. And I've been fortunate myself that I worked in a number of Nicolás de Guelga, as did other people at Fintan and, and many others along the way. Um, and they're still going strong to this day. And, and really, that is a huge legacy of, from Conrad de Guelga. And, and really, we have to think of Thomas Bonuk and Cannon and those when we, when, we, when we look at that legacy. So we do. Um, now, um, but as we continue with education, so remember, um, we're taking a little bit of a step forward and a step backward here in our next little bit. But um, so, so that remember, one of your own thoughts, um, there are one of your own thoughts, um, it will have said, um, it needs a fee on as will have said, nor, nor, um, story, nor. <sighs> Nora Honikan Skulls in aid in a story in this time I cancer and Skulls, not my and Skulls, time I cancer nudes a war, needs egg for his heon. Um, I guess fresh bunny and seer thoughts, mass mile in Eshen horse or edge. So, um, when the 26 counties were set up, um, Conra Naguilge withdrew from the six counties okay i suppose it was a political thing at the time that you know that the, that um that it became known today as northern ireland um and the six counties conran aguilga stood back from if i was to be critical and i don't want to be critical because remember i'm looking at this with hindsight but um I, I'm, it's the one thing that Conor and Goyle get done that, that when I look back on it, that I suppose I often think had they stayed with it um, and helped out in the six counties more. Now, having said that, there's tremendous work with the Irish language going on in um, across the board. And actually, we're grateful to say that our own... Um, cultures, um, our own, um, the, the Irish College and the Celtic Junction Arts Centre actually collaborate with Enoch Waka in our Ma. So Enoch Waka is an example of, of, um, of, the, of, of the education and Ngwilge um, blooming and succeeding in the six counties. But I believe had, had Conrad Ngwilge maybe stayed there, maybe they wouldn't have had some of the obstacles they've had. But we could go on and talk about that. But we'll continue with our story. But it's, it's, it's a very interesting conversation. And I'm sure um, many of our colleagues um, in, in Ochoaca could fill us in on that in the future on, on, on some of that. But, but it is a very interesting topic. Now, as we think of the Kolosh the Goilga and um and, and the Irish speaking languages, remember Park Mac Pierce was a big big believer in them and actually has uh, in quite an influence on on my own parish at home. Um and and um but if you look at it, one of the things that came from a meeting which Park Mac Pierce described was actually said by Mr. Thomas Ash. And if you look what what, what how um uh, Pierce described it, um one of the um, suggestions that, that um, Thomas Ash gave at the business meeting was to, to locate um, training, Irish language training college in Gaeltuk speaking areas, in Irish language speaking areas. And my area at home is one of those areas, the Connemara Gaeltuk. So it is actually one of the things that is still with us today, this system with the Irish colleges and, um, and the training of the teachers in the Royal Talks. Education in Irish is not only focused on, on, um, on learning Irish itself, although that is one of the factors, but it's not the only factor. So think of people in the Royal Talks who grow up in the Royal Talks, who, who speak Irish every day. So remember, education for them is not only the language, even though they're very proud of the language, but it's also, um, 
it's also um, functioning and 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 being able to go out in the world, whether you go um, for whether you, your focus becomes in culture and business and law, whatever it is, basically all of the things which um, the education system set up by the English in 1831, which Park uh, MacPierce called the murder machine. It's 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 the opposite of what the murder machine was. It's education should help somebody flourish, and education in Irish should be the same. And Conra na when they were uh, when they were going um, when they were thinking of on Avilchan and 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 Ferberts, um, they understood that to develop something, they um, they needed to take grasp of all of this. So. Um, as Conrad Aguilga went out with with the Timri and the organisers, they had quite a lot more in mind. Higshid Gorathavok le Kultur ne Hayden. Higshid eshin agas Krosshit spas on his kvetsish bela des ne Hayden a walu is Higshid on severs tanga visitier agas Higshid fashion gora ma tarlu le shetangas Higshid on tavok the one le Krohu. Beledis. So they understood the importance of culture in the country. And even though they understood that the language was in decline, they understood the importance of, of gathering the folklore of the country from the people who had the rich language. And they also promoted it. You know, they, they gave space for it to flourish. And but um, as I think of the the um, those who who um who gathered the information. I, I, I remember myself when I was in college and um, I remember calling mom one day and I was talking to her about, oh, this essay I was writing or this assignment I had. And I was talking about Sean McRaymond and sure the answer she gave me, and so she was telling me how it was many, um, a, a, a cup of tea she made for that man. But that was an example of how they went around the country and they stood in, every, in, in, in many, a house that they gathered information and that is evident from the um from from the Bela de Stabali from from the folklore that they have gathered but one of the things that they that they done that is still with us today um and it's one of the things that's very close to my own heart and it's actually something we celebrate um in the Celtic Junction um art center every year and that's Eructus Nagailge so Saula Garbunio Eructus Nagailge in Octig Nechashak is going to have four scholarly books I guess but she couldn't go ill go one so Conrad Gaelge set up Eructus in 1897. So what is Eructus Nagailge? Eructus Nagailge is a celebration of the Irish language, the Irish music, the Irish dancing, the old traditions, the folklore, the Lubini. So the people who, who, who join us um, in the Celtic Junction Arts Centre every year to celebrate it know what I'm talking about when I talk about the Lubini and the conversations back and forth and the drama, the dramas that... Um, that that um, the Eructus produce year in year out. So if you're unfamiliar with them, one place you could check it out is go to Mulchgill Punk IE, no Mulchgill Mulchgill dot IE, um, or or um, you could join us next year in the Celtic Junction, hopefully to celebrate it. Now this year, for example, one of the things that happened due to the time we're living in, um, the Eructus did not go ahead. Um, in Galway, as it was planned, it was due to go ahead in Galway City this year, and um, and of course Connemara was connected. No Connemara, Windsor Connemara v. Their Kanglilet, but it didn't go ahead. But people. Um, organize things online and um and and many of those are um you can you can watch many of those as i said already on mulch scale but that's an example of something that conran set up in 1897 and that that's still going ahead um that um some of those um that you know they were 
thinking of the culture and the importance of the culture. And by creating something like this, this is something that, you know, they were looking to the future of what could be carried on and how it could be carried on. So if anybody ever asks me, um, oh, what should I do in Ireland? And I always ask them if their calendar is open and then I will tell them, go to Erechtas na Gaelge. That is the thing people, I recommend people to go to. To me, it's the highlight of, um, it's Oscars na Gaelge, if, if you want, for want of a better word. Um, but, but, um, but hig Conrad na Gaelge, on tavacht a wan le le shetanga agus shetanga laurha. So just as we said at the beginning, the, the, the people who set up Conrad na Gaelge understood the, um, understood what it was all about, about nach fedzer le tenga marithal morwil chanal marithal kushtali. And, you know, that's what we said at the beginning. It was exactly what um, Douglas Dehiza said, you know, that uh, um, the language has to survive by the fireside. So mara dhurt me hig conra na gweilge an tavak de vi le se galtur. A kig siad freshen an tavak de vi le na cantra cha galtachta. Agus nach fedzer mara dhurt me an tseang a marag tal mara gul chen an marag tal kushtali. So it had to, they, the conra na gweilge, the Gaelic League understood that the language had to survive by the fireside for it to survive. And as you can see here, I think it's a perfect quote. Um, Anyther could be at Winsor and Royal Tuck the Tubber and Royal Gate is Cron Taco or Gulter the Rukish. So, th to me, that is, um, that is, is, is so important. Now, I do know that the language is flourishing throughout the country, but I do really believe that, that, um, the Goyle Tucked areas, the Irish speaking areas, are the well of the Irish language. Now, having said that. What Conrad Goelge is all about was the promotion of the language. And remember, they didn't just stay in, they, they, they promoted, were happy to promote in America or London. And really, when you look at that, that's succeeding. You know, that, that goal or that, that vision on fish, shin, eviaku, shin, shin, on chomerica. That is evident here in America. That vision they had, that's coming to fruition. That is obvious that that is alive and well in America when you look at everything that's going, around, going on. If you just have to look at, you know, the activities in the Celtic Junction Arts Centre and the many more arts centres and cultures Cultural, Irish cultural centres throughout the states and throughout the world, that that is um, continuing and 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 that is alive and well and 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 also it's 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 um, it's very important to say that you know I mentioned Erechtas na Gaelge, but Erechtas na Gaelge, um, it 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 takes place in Ireland and of course it is really Munster na Gaeltoc that attended. Um, constantly, year in year out, but remember that it's rud, it's 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 an in, it's international as well. That 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 we have people participate in Erechtas na Gaelge from all over the world, and but in touch on spirit nashunta agus on spirit Gaelge Gaelach a villa towards Fuidara in Og agus Iste or in the Galier on Air Oud. So Sean T. O'Kelly in 1963 said that it was wonderful to see the national spirit and the Irish spirit um, at young and old at the Feshina, um, at all the Feshina in Ireland and at the likes of the Erechtas as well, as I mentioned. But that's not just in Ireland. That spirit of what Conor na Gaelge and that vision, that's evident uh, at all the Feshina, and I'm sure all, there are many of you here tonight that have attended many a Fesh and have experienced that um, that um, that experience which Conor na Gaelga was all about and the understanding of culture and the promoting of it and, and the enjoyment of it, of course, most importantly. That spirit is evident today, that spirit of culture. It's evident at the feshes, as I said, it's evident at at Erechtas na Gaelge, but it's also evident online. If you go to many online forums today, you will see Gwil Aats Lárnach Egan Gaelge. Egan Gaelge, Gwil Aats Lárnach Egan Gaelge, agus Gwil Aver Egsula Afle in Gaelge. So that culture is... is um, 
is evident and and there is um as i said there are many online forms for it but when you look at where that came from so remember if we look back to 1893 and what where things were. So people, Vinyarth Kansorion, Ach Nivro Unnedid Yehorion, Ach Ishinrots Vifaitis Fuimel Natanga, Agus Tadolkan Keen Moor, Dunta, a Conran Aguilga, Agus Upper All Words, Dunta, Conran Aguilga, Narida, Elia, Shreve Tanga. Okay, so Conran Aguilga has really worked with um, the written language and in promoting the written language and and allowing, I suppose they gave people space initially to grow and to, initially they put um, emphasis on speaking the language. And even though initially, remember at back, at, we, we, we spoke at, um, in the 1880s, how all the emphasis had been on literature and very little on spoken. But as Conran and Gwailge developed, they were able to um, work with both side by side. So they had the Timurai go around and then, but they also understood that, um, that, that, that the, the importance of, of, of the written language as well, and that that was needed side by side. Um, and Honig Boru, Fui Skrivnor, Fui Nagwilge, is the Rerekele, um, Ratio Kunspozi, Eg Sula, Fui Kursi Klo, Agus Kursi Kaizan, Agus Kanonsi. So um, you will often, um, so any challenges that were there to do with the, um, the, the challenges when people would talk about dialects, you know, what dialects people write in and so on. You know, that was organized and, and the standard language was introduced. But um, but not only that, the Kaizans, the various, um, the Kaizans celebrated and gave space for people to learn the language. But the dialects were also celebrated throughout the written work. And it was thanks to Conran Aguilge that Irish speakers um, and readers got to um, enjoy, you know, written work of the time. So Conran Aguilga created that space for writers, writers of the Irish language um, to flourish. So when I think of what of writers that flourished with Conran Aguilga, I think of um, a Shos of Macriona, um, uh, Martin O'Hein, um, um, Pariko Conra, and many more. And to this day, writers are still flourishing, um, thanks to Conra Nguilge, um, really and truly. So much so that, um, you know, there are a hundred new books being published every year. So, so when you think of where they started with just pamphlets in eighteen, in the eighteen eighties, in the eighteen nineties, in Park Macpherson, and we had the Clive Sullish and all of that. But to think of where we have came to that a hundred books are being published a year. I mean, that's a huge thanks to Conran Nguilge. And um, I, I thought it was very interesting. Uh, um, um, of course, I'm a fan of Martin O'Hein. Um, those who know me are aware of that. But I thought it was very interesting what what um, what, what Martin O'Hein actually said about Conra Nagoilga and about Shos of Macriona and Pariko Conra, two fantastic writers um, um, that that left us many. Um, rich and beautiful story from 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 that um the, the days gone by but ni skrif nor i gael gevach unto marach un conra that's very um so he said that there would not be irish language writers only for conran only for the gaelic league so that's a huge statement to say that two of two of of, of our you know two fantastic writers in the literature, in the Irish language literature, would not be writing in Irish, if they would be writing at all, um, if it were not for, for Conran and Gwilge. Conran and Gwilge created a space. Now, I know for people in today, when we look at things today, we're blessed with all the facilities we have, as I alluded to earlier with the forums. There are many of them online. All you have to do is click on Tourishk.ie and you will see our newspapers and all of that set up. But that had to, 
what that what we have today that came from Conran Aguilge, from the foundations they set, and from the trials and errors that occurred along the way. But for somebody like Marcin O'Kine to say that, I I, I believe. Um, to me, that's a, that's that's a compliment as as good as Conran Aguilge will ever get, and to get it from Martin O'Hein, I think. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with Martin O'Hein, I suppose in my eyes, I look at him as, you know, how people talk rave about James Joyce and Ulysses in English. For me, I look at he's the James Joyce of our Irish literature. That's what I, how I would describe Martin O'Hein. And as we enjoy. Um, the many books and the many um, forms we have today. This did not happen overnight. This took struggles. Now, Conrad Aguilga set the foundation and, and it opened the doors for many things, including broadcasting the Quiltorot. So, now, I'm going to share I'm sure your thoughts. Um, Vinyart Smwinsa Agusvi is the Grand Fishon Gamach on Sea Religa Kainz and Oilge Agus Bunyu Radio Aiden and Isaac Fishay Agus Dorchid Gamach Nyart Ot on Gongwilge. So when you think of the vision they had and when the Free State was established, um, and when you think back to when Radio Erin was established in 1926, you know, they said there would be a central place for the Irish language. But in actual fact, um, apart from a little bit here and a little bit there, there really wasn't. And it was a, you know, it was a struggle and there was a fight along the way. And Conrad Aguilga was there for a lot of it and they had set the foundation of, of um, which helped people go forward. And even though Douglas de Hiza was asked to launch the new station and he, wa he was hopeful that it would be really there to reach people um, in the Irish speaking communities, in the Wild Thoughts areas. But the actual fact was it didn't happen. And um, I suppose we're going to fast forward on a bit now, really, when to to um when you think of Glushacht Karta Shivaltacht na Royal Tacht Shivalt on So that's the civil rights rights movement. Remember the goal of Conran Aguilga was to spread the language. And I'm sure little did Douglas de Hiza think um, as he as he helped um, with 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 Radio Aaron in in 1926 um, when Radio Aaron was founded. Little did he think that the people in the Gueltox regions would not be represented. Um, so unfortunately, one of the sad things that happened was the government, due to economic policies and the and and the lack of um, I suppose the, the, the IDA had been set up in some regions, um, but there was no policy or um, employment policies set up for the Gueltox regions. So the people living in the Gueltox had to fight for them. And that is what came about with Glushot Kjarta Shivaltok, the Gueltox, and Snushaskazi, a Horlishesha, and Gusmahas Shahanik Gilta Aaron. So out of the civil rights movement in the 60s came Gueltox Aaron. And Gueltox Aaron, I suppose, became like um, the IDA that was elsewhere in the country um, for industrial development. But one of the things that came out of this was our radio. Our, our radio our radio channel and I know that might seem today like a very simple thing but at the time that was huge and I'm just going to walk you through how this came about it's actually um in um for any of you who've ever been to a smoke inside my cause there was um they, they set up a, in a caravan there and uh, and people held the mast and they set up a pirate radio station. Now, remember, in the seer thought, this was against the law, OK, that they were setting up a pirate radio station. So imagine that of what where Douglas Dehees and Sean, Sean um, Owen McNeil and Park McPierish and all the other fantastic people who had been trying to promote the language. Imagine the thought of Ireland in a free state having people in the Royal Talks trying to set up a pirate radio station so they could be represented and getting and this considered you know um unlawful now 
thankfully they succeeded and we have today what's called as radio and um it's if if you haven't heard of it before i recommend you check it out as you can see there it's radio but this was a huge deal and this was the first place where we 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 glower on hope. We glower on hope. The scribes nor this we ought on we should then on. I go he've quilt worked or he've got pushed all. But um, as well as hearing their voice on the radio, it also opened up to um, a chance for I believe for the different Gwiltok regions to connect. Because remember, this was pre cell phones, pre all of this. We're talking the 1970s Ireland. You know. Um, you know, the economic policy in the Gwiltox regions was still immigration, whether, you know, people were wanting to admit it at the time or not. That was the fact, you know, and so this really connected the people. And this is still um, this is still true to this day that the, the radio connects them. Thankfully, today, um, we are represented as we can, we now have four radio stations in Ireland and that might seem like very little but we're a small island and if you think of it but to have the Gwiltox regions represented so we actually have Radio na Gwiltox, Radio na Liffa, Radio Falsa, Radio Rira, as Radio na Zreb. So this is a huge um, deal but remember that people actually went to prison fighting for these things and not only fighting for a radio but also fighting for a television channel now that might sound absurd um in today's society think somebody went to prison for this but these were rights that the people did not have and this grew um and grew until thankfully in 1996 we actually launched our TG car, which is um Telefish Norelge Car. So um so um now again one television channel might seem very little, but it's actually made the language sexy. I know it's put the language out there for people. Remember, the radio channels were really focused at people in the Gweltuk regions, but the television channel was it accesses everybody. It's actually a, it's the dream come true for the vision of Dahidza to see the Irish language, people being able to access the Irish language in their own living rooms you know and it was a huge deal i remember it was of course it was launched on uh, Iha in um 1996 and i remember Sinead Nguir thought, and uh, and it was a huge deal you know that did the not that night when the television channel was launched in ireland it was a huge deal for the language it was a celebration it was it was really when you think of it 1996 it was more that it was more than a hundred years on from when Conrad Aguilga was established. Imagine, imagine that you know that it took that long. But having said that, imagine the joy that people felt on that night. And I believe Sinead Nguir, when she ex when she said her piece here, I it's Mrs. Sinead Nguir, Tamema Hass and Shai Kyanoras T G Car T N G. I'm less sure T N G. Imel Natida or Imel Nahorapa a grill or oil talk on the Mara a knock the hahana e has brought the a knock the tossing on Vlian or Kelsok agus a knock tossing Shervish Telefish the Tirsha Mara knocked e ha Oskelse. Tina G. So this was the launch of the television, of the Irish language television. And as she said, she was in standing at the Irish language television headquarters on the edge of the country, at the west of the country, on the edge of Europe, in the centre of the Gwiltok speaking regions. And not only did they, did they, you know, as she introduced it, but they also launched it on the our Iha Hauna, which is the 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 new year for the Celtic New Year. It's the beginning of the Celtic New Year. And as she said, so as she said, tonight starts, not only was it celebrating the Celtic New Year, but it was the start of a television service in the country. So really, to me, that's a hundred years on and Douglas de Heeds's dream and fish, 
it was coming to the forefront it was evident it was coming alive and that to me um you know was started and initiated by okay maybe Conrad and Aguilga were not necessarily there it was Michael D that was there on the night but but there it came from the roots of Conrad and Aguilga, this all um this motivation when you think really that it took that long for um something like this to come to fruition it's quite it's it's um quite amazing actually but also if you look at the journey that Conran Aguilga actually took and Nakarta Shivalta Awanshi the Mach um Gonsanga um Nakarta Tanga Tabinta Mahaku Queen Nira Hosshield Queen Nira Hosshi the Queen were Karta Tanga so think of when Conrad Aguilga started thinking of language rights remember we were looking at the what had happened from you know from 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 the um 18th and 19th century and and when they start when they started thinking of this towards towards the end of 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 the the um, you know when, when you when you think of when Conrad Nguilga was actually set up nira ahantish ifigula bi egongilga in octig nihadzi rinya on conra irocht olwar ahantish olga hanga dukush natida i guess you know that is quite amazing that they made such an amazing effort to um to give this recognition and to bring this recognition to the Irish language and we've gone through that there this evening really and I suppose um I often wonder you know and I think of Douglas de Hiza and all he achieved and the people around him Park Mac Pierce, Owen Mac Neil, um Thomas Ash, Nadini Sha uh, Norma Brunswick, Nadini Sha Ligla Conrena Gaelga a V on August a Glock Ports um or Kiawan or Kuyagan. So the people that took part in various ways. Um and then when you think of it how their role evolved with the free state, you know, um how they still wanted to put the language forth, but their role really evolved with the free state i suppose the free state took over the education side of things although conran aguilga um and the the kolosh the the kolosh the sovereign kolosh the aguilga still went ahead the the colleges um went ahead that and um, it is really what we have today but their focus became on the written work as well as the um, Balu Edzachas and 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 so on, but you know if you think of that journey, that that it took till 1937, um, that Grush Gra Ahantis fought it. Near war and Tanga Gaelic Ahantis, so to think that our language, that the Irish language didn't get recognition in our own constitution till 1937, but I suppose that brings me now on another journey and I suppose it's a journey towards the future and you know from where where we're going and how long it's taken us a hundred years to get a television channel but if you look at it it took us a hundred and ten years to get a, com a language commissioner now um so um like you know things moved very fast for a period and things went very well but there's still much work to be done um and in actual fact they're still struggling <laughs> to get a language commissioner in the six counties you know again it's something we alluded to earlier with the free state um with the foundation of the free state and the six separation with the six counties we we see how Conrad Aguilga had pulled back. Perhaps had they remained, would we have been further along? Perhaps um, there's a lot of questions, but I suppose the bigger questions that we have now is going forward, you know, um, to still make space for um, the language and to still, um, to still, um, Give it Mar Mardershia the tall on Ibra, Lidon the Gafol, Concarta 
So unfortunately, we do have, I don't, I mean, don't mean it unfortunately in a negative, I'm, I'm really commend and I um, applause and Rene Gaelga for all the work they have done. And I would love to be here this evening and say, oh, it's all done. It's an absolute, you know, the Irish language is spoken throughout the country. It's an absolute success. Yes, the Irish language has been spoken throughout the world. And yes, it's growing in many areas. But in actual fact, we have many challenges still to... Um, protect and bring the language for, forward because although the language has spread in certain areas there is a decline in the Gaeltox um, in truth due to economic um, situations. So much work remains to be done both inside and outside the Gaeltox but it, that all said it does give me hope when I see what's going on in America, when I see what's going on in Dublin, when I see what's going on around the world. Yes, it is true. Tastian um nis ta nis mule on the snugil tohti, agas tiva mugunagil tohti, ni lane avaris for sha. A kuna sha yuna kaha on estoiga gaha on pobble social ta tak le hele um le hele Leonard Zanga football. So we need, I suppose, uh, to, to all come together. Our, I suppose our, our um, society needs to connect, I suppose, in Ireland with, with the language, I suppose, more um, in, and to continue the vision of Conran Aguilga. And really, when we look back at Conran Aguilga, we must celebrate what they have achieved. I'll go back now and what I want to do is I want to show you that um, Thomas Oakenkannon that I mentioned there earlier, that he came with the Heads and Douglas the Heads and Owen McNeil really were the founders of Conan O'Gailge. Um, but they came, um, Thomas Oakenkannon actually returned back to the States in 1905 and he went to um, he traveled, they traveled, they both traveled around the state, you, the United States, and they were, um, they were really, what they were doing was raising money, raising funds to continue. But um, in the library, actually, we have one of the books that while Douglas Dohizu was on this journey, he kept a diary or a journal story of the, the um, of this um, tour he took. But at the time, when you think of it, they raised $20,000. That's a, like, that's a huge amount of money today, but at that time, it was an astronomical amount of money. And, um, and actually, Thomas O'Kincannon came with them. And actually, in 1905, they, we all know that the earthquake, the huge earthquake that happened in San Francisco, well, they had just left San Francisco two weeks before that earthquake. But what they'd done when they heard about the earthquake, they were elsewhere in America. But what they actually done, they returned to San Francisco and they returned the money that they had gathered in San Francisco to the people because they understood that did that money back but they continued on elsewhere in America and they actually ended up raising 20,000 pounds and that was a huge sum of money so Natalie now is going to actually show us that in the library we actually have that book available in the library so Natalie would you be able to um, show us and then in just to let you know the other um, but Conrad Aguilga um, their um, two years ago or I suppose a year and a half ago now um, actually translated that book to English and we actually have the English version as well as the Irish version. Okay Natalie, which, have you got that there Natalie? So that's it, so Mahoris Gomerica, so my tour to America and um, and we have that in the library and it's so she's grief is a shan claw marekis to but the kids and shin is jahan for minnesota so there's actually a chapter on everywhere he's gone and in the book he writes about actually walking on the ice in minnesota on the on the river and it's it's quite um phenomenal um but i'm it's one of the i believe it's one of the gems of the own mckernan library that that's actually um here so mahoris gomerica and um and as you can see there, Douglas Hyde's American Journey was the translation of that. So now, um, so there, really, if you're in the library there, what I recommend, um, um, 
they would be, <laughs> that's one of my first places to go to in the libraries to those books. But then the other things that if you look at the other books that I mentioned, Eroctis Nogailge, um, is that the Eroctis one, Natalie? Um, so we also have the um, essays. Um, so we have the other, so from the, so here are some of the, oh, Shade and Irish So Shade on, um, this is actually a combination of, um, these are some of the volumes of the magazines that were written by Conrad Nagoilga at the time and and Irish Lar Nagoilga that was written at the time. So they're actually in the library. So they are, so um, they're hopefully when we'll all get out of um, this pandemic and this lock up with COVID that this is one of the things you can go back and visit actually and see and you can also see the um okay okay the fish so again the Conrina Gaelge so Kershid Beamer and Gulthor Agus um Erinsanga at Kyongan Valley or Inishi they known to treat efficiently so the fishes would have been a big deal and again this is one of the or one of the syllabuses from 1909 so you can see that this is in the library in the own in the own McKiernan library as well as you can see it there um now Natalie as we move on Oh, we've also so at the time Shkriv Shiad, um Oh no, these these are actually the S. These are actually the volume one and volume two. Shadid ne rodiyata on on eruktes. Shadid ne hashti shkrivu. Um, fuin egan eruktes egan om. So see, these are some of the um, um, kentanam nadini glock parts and eruktes. Um, so the, the the people who took part in the eruktes and and what and they had to um write their essays. So these are some of these in these compilations here that you can see. So Nish Bokum and Zarai could see on um so and they, they created their own handbook. So remember they had the teachers going traveling throughout the island. So the handbook of the Irish teacher this one was written by McGinley, but um um there, they had um, directions for people um, and for the teachers. Remember that, you know, Natimri Dos Hosushi the Malele has got Thomas O'Kankananak, Zereri Helevida, a maid, the on the moon, sorry, Will said. So, um, as the number of teachers increased, they had um, directions as to how they should, um, you know, what they were to do and how, you know, Arnus Munter bit on Mons Lot on Yvon. They, they had they they set up these protocols for teachers or these advice for teachers now um and so so remember when thomas um Bonnock and cannon came home one of the people who influenced thomas Bonnock and cannon um to actually go teaching was actually park mcpierish and park mcpierish himself we could um we could spend a lot of time on him i it'd be very him, a man who spent a lot of time in Rasmok and Fairness. And, um, but Park McPhirst was the one who convinced um, Thomas Bond, um, um, like Oliver Moher, he, he was the one who convinced him to go on the road. And, um, and, and Thomas himself, um, as um, our Park, um, Park McPhirst, um, he um Korshahin, Marzor Shahin, Pionle Park, and Misak Minik Fashan. So he, um, a huge character and then actually the other book we have and we have and th we have more books by Park McPierce in the library as well for when we do get back now um remember I mentioned earlier about a vineyard that that Thomas um, Bond ended up in in California in Livermore in California for those of you who are familiar with it well actually that vineyard is still going today um so if you think of oh in Ishman, go Livermore so I mean if you think of that um you know that's a bit of a deal, but that book is in the library, and it's a very interesting book. So, um, on 125 years, the vine vineyard are also going. So it's it's a it's um that's a bit of a gem in the library. I know it's it's on about wine. It's a bit of a different topic, but if you think of the journey at that time that Thomas Bond took, um, it, it's very interesting um journey. Um, so now, remember, Nis Lucia Lume Vima Kantz for Joseph Macriona. So, I mean, Joseph Macriona's um, work, he was one really, you know, I, I speak about Martin O'Hein. Okay, I'm biased. Martin O'Hein is from Connemara, and I believe he's just, he was a phenomenal writer. But Joseph Macriona, 
um, was another fantastic writer of his time. And he's probably, he would have been up there with one of the best writers that came from, uh, came from Ulster, from, from Ron Ferrish, actually, he's from a Johnny Gallman. But, um, to Sir Ross said, ah, um, rec- um, but this, here, some of samples of his work can be also seen in the library. As can, I, I also mentioned, now remember, the, I mentioned shows of, um, and, um, and Pariko Kunra. And remember, we, we mentioned that Martin O'Kane questioned, would either of these two have been writing in Irish if it was, if it was not for Colin O'Gailge? So, um, and Marek and Tuan Shin, these are um, some of Parik O'Kunra's work here, which is also available in the library. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. And um, um, for anybody who went through the education system, um, I don't think you could have missed Skushgilta in Ireland. I see Fintan, you're smiling there. So, um, and, and um, so as you can see, um, they are some of the works that are available in the library. I know I went through that fast, but we could have spent maybe two more hours on it, but we'll, we'll better continue because I want to get people involved in the conversation, really. Thank you very much, Natalie. Gurmila Mahat, Natalie and Shen. So, Anish Fintan Asura, um, Agus Nancy, um, so now we're going to talk more about the Irish language and I think it's important to get people's personal experiences and the journey the language has meant because everybody's journey is different and everybody has different experiences but as I said panel um, um, Natalie, can we stop the share on the screen? Is that or no? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, so Anish Fintan, um Latsa. So Fintan, um Abrilon for the Horus, Gudisha, and Merlin I'll get on Rawets and Agus Nancy and Vertagi. So Fintan's it took all of us at Mas Milet. The Khanun to Kleshtail, I guess, uh, Ruskamok, Rusmok, Abu, Kanamara, Abu. <laughs> um, I think my my journey in the Irish language begins long before I was born. Um, my grandmother, my mother's mother, was born in Kerry in 1905. And so, right in that time, um, when the Tomas Bon or Con Cannon was um, coming and going from the US to Ireland and, and before the first Timura. And in the, the the first generation, really, of Conor Nguelga. And um, she was sent by her family to boarding school in England. And um, she came back with no Irish, um, even though she was a Kerry woman. And um, she married um, a guard, a policeman from Clare, who was 10 years her senior, who had fought um, uh, with the East Clare Brigade um, in our struggle with the English, let's call it. And um, and she raised eight children. And my mother was born in 1928. So, you know, two years after the founding of Radio Erin. And so kind of in the middle of all of what you've been talking about um, are these, you know, individuals that I, you know, was raised by. And, um, but the Irish language was um, anathema in my grandmother's head she um she thought she thought that irish was um a backward language um it was associated in her mind with poverty and with disadvantage and when we say poverty we don't just mean um you know mild inconveniences but abject poverty people living in you know in the 20th century in mud huts um you know that the Black Valley in in uh, in Kerry was the last part of Ireland to be electrified. Um, you know, living in really, really, really tough, unsanitary, unpleasant, cold, damp um, places. And you know, English, the language in which one would sell a pig, um, was the language of commerce, the language of trade, the language of um, maybe not a middle class, but a surviving class that could make it through from one year to the next with most of their children still alive. And um, she aspired to um, raise her children with English because she thought that was the best thing for them. And you mentioned, Lavinia, that the psychology and the sociology of the time. Um, my grandmother would say all the time that um, we have heads like chickens with only one room for one idea in our heads at a time. 
And um, she really thought that the, the Irish language would take up room in your brain that could otherwise be used for English or for other pursuits that would be more important. And this is not a nasty person. This is not necessarily an ignorant person. This is a woman of her time and a woman of her generation and a woman of her socioeconomic um, class. Her people worked on the railroad. They had decent jobs. Um, the railroad, of course, was really kind of a, um, a branch of the empire. Um, it wasn't just, you know, a neutral body. It was part of how the British Empire conquered the world, and they were part of that, and they were very proud of their role in that. And they had relatives that fought within the British Army and fought, you know, um, for the empire over the, the generations. And, and they were not alone in Ireland in that. But she raised eight children and um, she didn't want them to speak Irish and to do anything with the language or the culture. And um, so that's, that's my mother. So um, my mother then went on to um, join the civil, servants, civil service. So she was a government employee. And um, as part of that, um, similar schemes to um, the schemes they had for the summer schools, um, she was sent off by the, the government to, uh, to run a fairish, to run a fest for a month at a time. I think she went like two or three summers in a row. And they were paid to go on these holidays, basically, to Donegal to learn Irish. And she loved it. And she loved the singing and the dancing and the language itself, and she actually became um, a beautiful Irish speaker in her own right, but um, not because of how she was raised, in, you know, in her own home. Um, and um, one of the problems, I suppose, that we had with the Irish language in Dublin when I was raised, I was born in 65, so skipping way forward. And 1905, my grandmother, 1928, my mother, and 1965, me. So she was 37 when I showed up. Uh, I was an unexpected adoption, apparently. Um, the One of the things that was current in Ireland in my childhood was kind of... Um, in people's minds, there was an equation between the Irish language, Irish culture, Irish dancing, Irish games, Irish sport, with um, the struggle for Irish independence and the IRA. And there certainly was um, a link between the Irish civil the the Cártaí Smiúlta and the Gaeltacht, the Gaeltacht civil rights movement, and the the freedom fighting um, as regards the, uh, trying to unify Ireland, the United Ireland movement, the the IRA movement, the Sinn Féin movement. Um, Sinn Féin, you know, had always been in support of the Irish language and culture, and um, but there was. Um, a sense, at least among maybe among middle class people in Dublin, particularly among Fine Gaelers, and my my mother's family were all Michael Collins supporters, and were definitely on the Fine Gael side historically, or the Clan Na Gael side. Um, but there was, in their minds, there was they were afraid of the Irish language and the Irish culture, because it kind of branded, it, it had associations, let's say, with with the IRA and with. Um, um, what they would have considered kind of criminal activity and gang activity, et cetera, et cetera. Now it's easy, of course, to make judgments looking back. And you know, today we sometimes glorify the the IRA, and particularly, I would say, uh, it can happen sometimes among Irish Americans. But for those of us living in Ireland in the 60s and 70s, you know, there were there were real um, implications um, for the IRA. We remember in our little town in, in Wexford and Gorey, um, the bank being um, held up by the IRA. The IRA you know, raised their money by selling drugs and robbing banks and uh, brutalizing people like every other you know, um, um, paramilitary organization in the world. Um, and so while their, their goals were, were noble, their means were not always. And so there was a fear there. And um, my parents were very much wanted us to be uh, friends with everybody and to be open to everybody. Um, they, we were raised Catholic, but they made absolutely sure that we had um, Protestant friends and that we were not um, raised, you know, in an insular kind of way in, in the, the place where we were living. Um, and so they were afraid of the Irish language uh, being something that would brand you as, as um, 
a separatist or an isol isolationist or something and not a modernist. And I think that goes back to my grandmother's thinking too, that the Irish language was associated with something backward and poverty ridden. Um, and um, they didn't know the riches of the language or the culture. They didn't know um, Martin O'Kine. They had read maybe a few books in school or since, um, but they, they were really not aware of the culture. And I think that's what the Timory were trying to do was to go around the country, not just as teachers, but also as community organizers. They built the movement from the ground up. They went from, from, from fireplace to fireplace and bringing people together and showing them the jewels and the beauty of their culture and giving them a sense of pride and a sense of identity, which really blossomed, I think, in Ireland um, in my generation, for sure, in you know, 1990, beginning you know, when uh, Irish people began to be proud again of their country and um, to be proud of their identity. And when I was a child, um, if you saw um, an Irish flag flying outside a house, it meant they were IRA sympathizers. Um, in 1990, when you saw an Irish flag flying, it meant they were supporting the Irish team in the World Cup. And from then on, um, and maybe not because of that, lots of things happened in the 90s, but there was a lot, there was a lot of pride in U2 and um, Sinead O'Connor and um, the Cranberries and Ireland came on the stage with movies and with a lot of glamour. Um, and there was a lot of pride and, and an economic revival that allowed us to not just be worried about making it through. Um, you know, would your children actually live to see adulthood, but would they live in Ireland and see adulthood and raise their children, or would they be educated and raised for the export market, as most of the generations before then were? It was only in the 90s that the um, 45,000 people who left Ireland every year to emigrate to, to other countries reversed, and people started coming into Ireland at the exact same volume that they used to leave. So it is true that the language and the pride and the sense of identity um, are all connected and it's taken a long, long time, I think, for that to change. Um, I don't think it's completely changed on the island. And um, if it's true that the Gaeltacht is stubborn, the the Gaeltacht are, you know, is, is stubborn, the Gaeltacht. If it's true that the Gaeltacht is the well and the source and the spring of Irish, um, the Irish language, I think it's also true that the island of Ireland is is too the the the, the well of the culture and uh, and the language itself. And I think as opinions change in Ireland. Um, the support for the language um, changes and the view of the language around the world changes. Um, I was going to say something else that went out of my head. Um, just one, one final piece was just, I cannot underestimate the, um, I can't overstate, sorry, the, the importance of writing the Gwelthachte, not just, um, uh, it did several things. It actually, you talk to old people who are alive today and they'll tell you that before writing the Gwelthachte, um, a person from Kerry would not understand a person speaking Irish from Kerry would not understand a person speaking Irish from Donegal. Um, the dialects are very, very different. If you were to hear them spoken or to see them written down phonetically, you wouldn't, you'd hardly know, well, Nancy Stenson would know, but the rest of us wouldn't be able to decipher what the hell was going on or what the connection was between them. But because of writing the Gwilthacht, the broadcasting in the four dialects repeatedly, every single day giving um, maybe not equal, but fair representation to the dialects, you know, um, over and over again, I think people began to be able to mutually understand each other. And it really knit the, the, the disparate communities because they had been isolated as little islands, little enclaves. Um, you mentioned Rathcarn, surrounded by English there, a little, not even a county, but just a little smidge in the middle of County Meath. Um, but it's the same is true for all the Gothics. They're all little enclaves. They're all cut off. They're all isolated. And mostly in economically um, disadvantaged areas, um, places that are hard to get to. Um, and and Red the Gothic, without destroying the language or without just doing anything negative at all to the language, has somehow managed to bring the, the, the communities together, both within the Gothics and also in Dublin, which is, you know, the largest city in Ireland, not a Gaelic, not always known internationally for its support of the Irish language, but really another cradle of the Irish language and a cradle of learning and of um, 
um, education and um, technology and advances in teaching and learning and speaking and archiving and all of those things. Um, but writing the Gelsakta has really helped um, speakers throughout the country and I would say speakers throughout the world. I know Lavinia tunes in, she tells, um, I can't say the word A-L-E-X-A -E out loud in my house because all my devices will go nuts. But there's a certain uh, lady friend of mine whose name is A-L-E-X-A -E and is sponsored by Amazon. And she knows how to turn on Ready to Girl Talks in my home at the drop of a hat. And I know she does the same in Lavinia's. And I can tune in at any time of the day and I can even listen to it in my car. The only problem, speaking, um, you wanted to hear my personal experience, the only problem I run into listening to Ready to Girl Talks in the car is that I tend to move over to the wrong, uh, sorry, the right side, the correct side of the road. So I have to be very careful. <laughs> when and where and in what state of mind I am when I'm listening to the to Reading the Girls Talks. And Tichi Kahar Television Nagelga has also been a huge boon for the language. And it has kind of in a way I there's no other way of saying it. It's made Irish sexy. Um whether it's, you know, uh, Dahi himself or the the lovely, you know, men and women who do the the weather uh, forecasting, um, it's really made the language attractive and interesting and modern and upbeat and cool and associating the language with soccer, with sports, with movies, with um, high energy, high quality, um, you know, production values is really done a lot for the language. Um, but what T.G. Cahar doesn't have compared to Ready in the Girls Talk, Ready in the Girls Talk is Irish to its heart. Irish is the language of its back room, its toilets, its engineers, um, the guy who, you know, mows the lawn. Um, you can smell the putching outside in the, in the, the front lawn in Kasla. Um, whereas T.G. Cahar um, has never really been that. English is kind of the language behind T.G. Cahar. Um, but they've done amazing work. But the, the heart isn't the same as um, as um, Ready the Grail Factor. Anyway, I'll stop talking because I could go on forever. I, and um, um, I, I know Nancy's just bursting to, to, to jump in and add her, her contribution. But Gurma has Lavinia. Oh, Gurma Mila has been on Vishashin. That was just fabulous. I think I could concur with everything you said. I thought it was fabulous. Um, very, very interesting. And thank you very much. So, Nish Nancy, Masha de Hele, Estor. Okay, well, I have the um, Strangeris perspective, the <laughs> Irish. Although I was noticing a piece from uh, Douglas Hyde's. Diary. I was looking through some excerpts I have from his writings of his visit to America, and Lavinia mentioned that he kept a diary. Um, and I found this piece, which I thought was a good way to start my bit. Um, he says, Nur Hosmer Rey Geolum, Ni Rasule Behagam Gomachan, Tim into Riov, Nagomachi and Ahusajum Hain. When I started to learn Irish, I was not expecting at all. I never expected that there would be interest in it, nor that I would use it myself. Uh, well, that's my situation as well. I, um, I hardly knew there was an Irish language until I was in my mid-twenties, and I came upon it and my work in it almost by accident. So the idea at the time I began to study it that I would someday build a whole career around it is still somewhat incomprehensible to me, I guess. Um, yeah, I started um, with a graduate school assignment to do a report on Old Irish. So I went to the library, got a book, found it to be extremely weird and wonderful, um, did my report, did some further work on it for another class because I was interested enough. But I'd always been oriented toward working with native speakers of living languages using a process linguists called fieldwork. Um, so Old Irish was not going to be my thing, it was clear. Um, shortly after my first encounter with Irish, <clears throat> I um, took some time off from graduate school and moved to the Boston area, where I found a community ed class in Modern Irish. So I said to myself, oh, let's give this a shot. And that's where I began to study the language. The teacher was a retired priest, uh, an African missionary who contracted malaria or something else nasty and had to retire early. Um, and he took an interest in me because he was a bit of a grammar nerd himself and he loved talking about grammar and most of his students did not, but he could see that I did. So he started giving me private lessons. I'd go out to the seminary, we'd have dinner, We'd talk grammar, he'd give me things to read, and that was how I really began to get a grip on the language. 
I then returned to graduate school and had to choose a dissertation topic. And everybody, myself included, pretty much figured I was headed from my first year of study there toward one of the native languages of California and doing field work in that. But I started thinking about my interest in Irish, and I started thinking about the prospect of nine months in Ireland doing field work or nine months on a reservation in the Mojave Desert. Well, what would you choose? Uh, I considered it something of a no-brainer, and so Irish became my dissertation topic. Um, when I went on the job market, I got lucky enough to find that there was a postdoctoral scholarship on offer back at the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies, and I applied for it. I had, while studying for my dissertation, been in Rakarn, the Gulf site that both Lavinia and Fenton have mentioned, which is near Dublin, and so I could go for weekends um, and then come back and use the libraries as I needed to and work with some people in Dublin as well. Um, and um, So I decided I would, because this institute that was offering the scholarship had a long history of doing dialect studies of Irish going back into the 30s, I said, I will do the dialect of Rathcurrent. And they gave me the scholarship to my astonishment. So I got to spend an extra year and a half in Ireland and actually kind of began to learn to speak the language. When I started, that wasn't my goal. When I started, I was going to do this field work, which you often do through the medium of English, and you focus on fine little grammar points so that you don't necessarily gain fluency from doing that kind of work. But everyone in the Gaeltacht assumed I was there to learn to speak the language, because that's why people go from Dublin to the Gaeltacht. And I realized, after a not too long time of going down there every weekend, that I actually was interested in the pe not just the language, but the people and their culture and their community, and I wanted to get to know them on their own terms, meaning in their own language. And so little by little, I began to develop some fluency in the language, and I was able to make that grow when I got to uh, back for my postdoctoral um, work. However, when I got my job in Minnesota, it had nothing to do with Irish. I was hired to teach French and linguistics. But um, I also had some administrative duties that involved meeting the language teachers throughout the university. And when I was talking to the Latin teacher, he asked me about my research interests, and I told him. And he said to me, I have a student who's very interested in Irish. You should meet her when she comes back from study abroad. Well, the next semester, she showed up in my office hours and said, will you teach me Irish? Uh, OK, I guess. I'm not sure how to do that. But I'll give it a shot, I said. I had never considered this possibility before. A week later, another student showed up saying, me too, please. <laughs> so we arranged a directed studies. There were no formal courses available, and I had to do this sort of in my own time, but I thought it sounded like fun. So we set up a directed study project for the following September. And by the first week of classes, there were four of them come to learn Irish. Two more had found me. It's kind of like the coronavirus, it just keeps spreading. Schachter. By the end of, uh, or by some point at the height of this, which went on for a few years, there were seven students learning Irish with me this way. And then somebody got the bright idea of establishing a real formal course, which I did in the early 1980s. And I have been constantly gobsmacked all the way through at the number of people who show up on the first day of class wanting to learn Irish. Now, I figured, you know, there'd be three or four. There'd be 20, even more sometimes. Now, they didn't last. Attrition was high. It always is in language courses, and Irish is not for the faint of heart. But, um, but there were always quite a few, half a dozen at least, most years who would finish out the year and some of them just wouldn't go away. They wanted to keep on. So we set up evening meetings to continue with it. And each successive offering brought a couple more people into that evening group. People came and went, and it was very informal. And gradually, it evolved from a um, formal class into a sort of easygoing reading and conversation group. They now call it a salon. Um, and um, it's still going. And some of those very first students are still with us. Uh, we now meet on Zoom, but we used to meet in my house and it was a lovely social evening. 
Um, still is, but Zoom, as you all know, is not the same. Uh, there have been a number of eye openers along the way, too. Um, connections that I found around the same time I started teaching. Um, another fellow, uh, an Irishman from uh, County Armagh named Dennis Clark, started teaching Irish in a, in a pub in St. Paul. And I went a couple of times and um, we got to know each other. And over the years, some of his students found their way into my formal course. And some of my students found their way back there and now are teaching because Dennis has retired and indeed passed on. Um, so some of my students wound up going back and taking up the teaching in that uh, community course. Um, and then Fenton came to town and started a course at St. Thomas and a number of times we've taught together at weekends and um, workshops, one day workshops and things of that sort. So there's been a lot of interaction among the various groups dealing with Irish. And I kept running into people in my early days here who would, people who had nothing to do with the university or my classes or anything, but I'd meet them at, you know, a party in my husband's office. And somebody would say, well, when I was studying Irish, I, and I'd sit up and say, you were what, where, when? And they'd, you know, taken a course in Michigan or Missouri or California or somewhere. Um, and I began to realize that there was an enormous amount of interest out there among, well, the, the classic situation is the third generation of immigrants suddenly want to go back to their roots and learn the language. And that was who a lot of the people were, but not all. I've had students with no Irish blood in them whatsoever. They just like funny languages. And this one is one of the funniest. Um, and we have had a lot of fun working with it. Um, I also discovered when I first started working with it in graduate school still, my aunt told me one day that my grandmother, who had died years earlier, was, to my great astonishment, a native speaker of Irish. Who knew? She would never have admitted it. Like Fenton's family, Irish was the language of poverty. Um, even her accent in English, if people complimented her on it, she'd be insulted because I left all that bog Irish stuff behind me when I came to America and I don't want to hear about it. So I never knew um, the, the whole time she was alive that she could speak Irish and it was only after she had died that I began to take an interest and learn it, but I've always regretted not knowing sooner. Um, so the language keeps coming around and popping into my life. Even my child, I had a daughter even later in life than Fenton's mother did. Um, and she accompanied me frequently on research trips to Ireland during the summers. So she picked up a few words here and there. Uh, I tried to get her a, an au pair, but that didn't work out. And I was a little too chicken to try and speak Irish to her all the time myself. I tried it for a full day and knew I could do it, but I spoke a lot less than when I spoke English. And I thought, okay, more is probably better than very. But she picked up some Irish while she was in the uh, Gaeltacht with me over the years. She did a couple of summer camps there. Um, she even chose to study it in college, although she didn't have a language requirement. She had met that with Spanish. Um, she chose to study Irish and I can't say she speaks it. She would never say so. But she has the couple of focal. She has more, in fact, of the couple of focal, the few words, than her Irish husband, who grew up in Dublin with a bad attitude toward the language. Um, but um, I think the thing I'm most pleased about is that I have students who've been there with me from the beginning and who are now off teaching and spreading the word and enjoying the language and that we're all still able to do it together as a source of great pleasure for me now that I'm retired and no longer teaching officially. Um, okay, a very personal account, but Shane Moshkel, Agus Gorina Milut Magi as Thanks, thanks very much for listening. Nancy Balu Yes Widder, Session Co Simul. So interesting. I would listen to you all day, honestly. It's such an interesting journey, both yourself and Fintan, Gormila Mahagai. So we just have some questions coming in now. So Ahard, this is when we're going to invite um so you can switch on your um cameras if you want and we invite you but i'm going to take the first question is for nancy nancy do you have any tips for um 
any tips for Irish as a second language learner, a second language learners who are trying to go from strong beginners learner to a solid strong intermediate level? Caltech, Minnesota. <laughs> well, the Monday night classes at Caltech, Minnesota. Well, once they meet again, I suppose yeah. this is not the time to be advising that since the pandemic has put a stop to all that. But um, so this person's located in California, so I think oh, the, never mind. The, the, our journey might be a bit far. <laughs> well, speaking of journeys, though, what a lot of people have done is um, is to go to Ireland and go to yes. Edithgail in Donegal, or to go to um, Ockadiv, the whole school to Gaelic in Cairo. Um, if you let us know, we'd be glad to share those information with you. Yes, there there's are, lots of places, but those two are outstanding. There are intensive courses in every Gaeltacht, actually. Yeah. Well, not Rathcarn, but that's Connemara anyway. Right. Um, so and depending on what dialect yeah. you want to learn, uh, those courses are a wonderful way to do it. Yes. And then we have another question in there. Is um, it was about the immigrants coming to this country? So I, we touched a little bit on this. So about why they didn't continue to speak the language once they arrived. Again, I believe that was to do with you know, um, con um, as as I think Finton um, put it, or the language was associated. You know, it was associated with poverty. And when you came, when they when the immigrants came to the states, they were trying to get away from poverty and to succeed. And you know we have this. We have the case in Minnesota, as many of you probably know of, is um, um, the book Bridget Conley wrote. It gives a good insight to forgetting Ireland, where people wanted to, you know, they, exactly they wanted to assimilate and really forget what they had um, left behind, the poverty they had left behind, and that actually continued up to recent times. I remember being at a wedding in Chicago a number of years back, and I met a man from my home parish, and he never would return because the memories he had were negative. And um, he, you know, as Finton kind of, you know, and we mentioned that um, how things had changed. He hadn't seen that progression, and he had um, right. the language was associated to him with with negativity, and that's why a lot of people didn't just like Nancy's um, aunt, um, etc. And 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 remember that happened on the reverse. People would return home to the Gaeltacht regions, and they would return home and continue to speak in English to mm -hmm. their parents who spoke <laughs> Irish, and that was a horrendous situation. But oh the yanks would come home and that's how they were treated and it was an awful situation that they would come home and not speak irish to their mm -hmm. parents and their parents had no english and that went on for quite too long unfortunately but, but again it was that whole thing yes Fintana, right last sorry well i think it's it's as true in ireland as it is over here that in order to have a, a vibrant language that passes on from generation to generation you have to have a community proximus around you and so um as long as there's an enclave um, if you look at the, say, Orthodox Jewish communities of New York, or Amish communities, or I live in Cedar Riverside in Minneapolis, which is a predominantly Somali um, neighborhood. And so you have children and teenagers who were born in America, but can speak their language. They can certainly argue in their language because I can hear them from my bedroom. Um, and they have their language, but it's because there's a, a population that is contiguous that is around them. And that allows the transmission of culture. And they have um, cultural institutions such as mosques in which the language is featured. Um, the Catholic Church, unfortunately, has never really been a champion of the Irish language. And the churches that the Irish um, ended up in in Minnesota, there were some churches in southern Minnesota where you might have had a small town um, that had a German Catholic church um, for the, Bavarian, or the Bavarians and an Irish Catholic church for the Irish. But for the most part, the churches, and this is not a criticism, it's more of a sociological phenomenon, um, were kind of assimilation places where people learned to become Americans and the, the goal was to be to become part of the melting pot become um, an American and to raise your children that way because that was where success lay that's where El Dorado was in that direction not the other other direction it was go west go west keep moving keep uh, making progress um, but there was also clearances in Minnesota in St. Paul and um, the very neighborhoods that were the Irish language neighborhoods just like the Rondo the um, black neighborhoods 
neighborhoods that were destroyed for making the freeway, th those neighborhoods were, were um, taken over and redeveloped and people were moved out. And also as people moved out of the suburbs in, in St. Paul particularly, um, they lost that connection with each other. So the generation that came from Ireland, if they did speak the, the language, um, would have spoke the language to themselves, to their relatives, to their peers, but not to their children. And um, other identity, other markers of Irish identity, such as the dancing and um, St. Patrick's Day and Catholicism, you know, were um, celebrated and got a lot of institutional support, but the language didn't. And um, I'm not saying that those are all the reasons, but they were certainly influencing factors in why the language didn't really continue in Minnesota. There was a time in St. Paul where you had to speak Irish to be a policeman because how else would you break up the fights in, um, in town um, when, at closing time when the pubs shut down? Um, but that has obviously changed. <laughs> Even in Boston, where there is a still a very large Irish community and many of them Irish speaking, though they didn't pass it on to their children, at least not very often. Um, I did a bit of research in New York, Chicago, and Boston some years ago, interviewing people about the question of transmission of Irish and who they used it with and when. And anybody in my generation or older, or even 10 years younger, um, never said they spoke Irish to their children, not one. They spoke Irish to their friends. They spoke Irish in the pub that, right. you know, all, all among siblings, all the rest, but not to their children. Interestingly, I also interviewed some younger people, people who were then in their 20s or so, 20s, early 30s. And this was back in the 1990s, so a new study is called for. Every one of them said, oh, yes, they did want their children to speak Irish, and they intended to speak Irish to the children when they had them. Unfortunately, none of them had children yet. So, right. <laughs> well, there was one couple who did. They had a two-year-old, and they said, yes, they did speak Irish to him. This was a couple in Chicago. But for the most part, the people who were you know, raised during the period when attitudes had begun to change, when the economy was better, when they thought they would probably go back to Ireland at some point, in their adult lives. Um, they all wanted their kids to have Irish. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I've often wished I could do that study again and find out whether any what of the heck was going on. Yeah. Pass it on. That's yes. another question. But um, that, that's very interesting, Nancy. I just want to let everybody know. So we're going to go over for about five minutes, folks, if, if that's okay with everybody. I know some people have had to leave. We've just had some feedback there from um, from from um, um, from people and thank you all very much for that. I know some people have had to go but but Nancy yes I find that study very interesting and just I do believe that um, that, that what you said Nancy um, was seems very accurate actually you know that there has been a change with I think but I think that has been thanks to again as we mentioned earlier Reggie Noel talked to TG Cahar as, as now the language is sexy whereas you know, before it was more of a sign of poverty. I do agree with that. So, um, so um, I just want to look here at this questions. Are there any developments in teaching in Irish in special ed? Um, and is there is socialising on Zoom within Ireland tending to make accents more uniform? So, so um, just with the accents. So, first of all, um, Arna G and T G Carr have made the languages more uniform. Most definitely, they've. So, um, so we've we have first of all we have what's called now we've standardised language. Okay, which which is taught in a lot of schools. But having said that, even outside that, in the Gael talks, um, people connect in the Gael talks now. For example, the Eroctus Nagoilga I mentioned. People will come together once we actually, the people from the Goethe region actually come together twice a year. We come together for Kermotis Pelna Goethe, which is held in June every year, and then we come together for Erectus in the Sauna, which is held in November. So every six months we catch up with each other. So that's that's so 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 we do and and do children of first in um want them to learn Irish? Well, I'm um. I, I have a little boy in my house and Irish is the only language we speak here. So it is myself and my husband and I'm not alone in that. I know that for a fact. I know many others um, abroad. So so um, I hope that's answering your question. I'm, I'm just trying to get to some of the questions there. Um, so, so far, I mean, I let you know if I inter encounter a roadblocks, but I'll be calling Nancy and Fintan if I do that. Um, so um, let me see. Um, I just want to make sure I get to all of the questions and socializing on zoom yes socializing on zoom um the actual um 
developments in technology has happened across the board in every language, not only in English, and they have happened in Irish as well. I mean, we have Twitter, Facebook, actually even recently now you can, the, um, there are phone, the phone in Irish, you can buy the phone set up in Irish so that with your fathers and all ready to go. So just to answer those questions um, there. Um, so I, I'm really grateful to everybody for, for, for coming in here tonight. And, and you know, the community here, there is, there always, there, you know, as Fintan mentioned there, there, there is always a community of, the Irish community in St. Paul was always quite strong, but there's the learners in St. Paul and Minneapolis and in the, in the Minnesota um, region is still quite strong. And there are many um, learners and we get together in different ways. We're blessed. We were hoping to have got together for earlier in the year, but hopefully we will get that next time round. Um, hopefully. Um, um, so I'm trying to just make sure I get to all of your questions. Um, but, Lavinia, I think it's one of the beautiful things about Celtic Junction is that, you know, we have the language and the dance and the music and the literary, the literature are all in the same place. I, there are, you know, there are very few Irish community centers in the country where, and it's, you know, where the language is, is featured as much as, as it is in Celtic Junction. And I think it's, it's to a large part, it's due to, to Cormac's um, you know, rootedness in the Irish language. You know, he's known internationally for his dance, but, you know, he's a musician, he's a fluent Irish speaker, and uh, I'm not just trying to suck up to anybody here, but he really has done, um, and, and Celtic Junction has done a, us all a great service in promoting um, a, a holistic culture and also embracing um, a diversity locally and internationally too, um, which is kind of the antidote to what my parents were afraid of because they thought that Irish was somehow isolating and um, uh, and it's not. It it is. It can be the key to uh, universalism. And I love um, Kate Daly's comment about the Ojibwe culture. There are huge parallels. I work um, within the native uh, community here. My boss is an enrolled member in the um, Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe, and she always introduces me to her elders as uh, this is Finton. He speaks his language, and they just know when you speak your language that you have a connection to your people, to your ancestors, and they would. Say to the the spirit world um, that is unique and is they honor that in me and they also share um, a history of colonization that the Irish also um, share and that is embodied in a language too and um, the history of a language like the history of a human body you know is evident in its um, in itself you know the whole language history of the Irish language from before the Irish language is evident in the language the words the structures the um, the influences, the scars, the, the, the beauty spots um, that it has inherited over the, the millennia. Um, and I think that's true too for um, our other indigenous languages. We see much more in common with our sisters and brothers. And it's a gateway to building human connections with each other rather than, again, the thing my parents were most afraid of was that it would make us um, dislike people or hate people. And um, I must say, as they grew older, they, they, they learned to change their ways. <laughs> and they spent, um, I think, 20 summers in a row in Cairo, um, reacquainting, re-embracing um, re the language and relearning the language and speaking it for two or three weeks every summer at a time and falling in love with the people of Connemara, which Lavinia will tell you is a hard thing to do. And I just, <laughs> thank you, Vinton. <laughs> Um, as I, I just want to answer there a question Joanna sent in. Um, so are there developments in teaching in uh, teaching Irish in special ed? Of course there are, because remember, people in the Royal Talks have the same, you know, needs and wants mm -hmm. as any mm -hmm. other community. So yes, of course, the moon sorry fouch the Yes, so there are, um, you, you know, you can get your speech language therapist. We have all of that is available now. And um, so just answering Joanna's question in that, so special education teachers are available um, in, in um, you know, in, in all across the board um, with the Irish language. So, um, so I know folks, we have gone over there a bit with time. I know we've had to say goodbye to some people. But a chords a gormil a mila magi as a vel lenya nacht em tamos fear fear wiyakib a fintan gormil a mila mahad tamos fear wiyakats agus Nancy gormil a mila magi aidi de pida an versagi 
I'm as cold we are I know near as your Mary near as Sagi cared to be you know kids but even my conscious the Malishka Fushan after a meal a meal a Maggie is spelling I guess a card to go here thank you all for joining us this evening and Natalie thank you very much for coordinating all of this and um, keeping us um, to time and all of the rest so um Shina will go full credit him and William Fuckle Skur Fuckle Zer Nock again yeah last word Final word, we always, of course, you know we're Irish when we say it takes us about 10 minutes to say goodbye, but we'll give everybody a chance to say final word. <laughs> the Irish goodbye and the Minnesota goodbye combined. So, so God help end. you. You'll be here till 12. <laughs> I'll mute myself. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> I'd love to say thank you so much. We saw so many class members. Of course, Lavinia teaches Irish here at the Celtic Junction as part of the Irish College of Minnesota classes. Uh, we have beginners up through advanced. Uh, we're doing uh, the TEG, which Lavinia could maybe give us a little mention on before we go. Um, we'll be returning to that. We're one of the few locations that host that um, certification in the United States. Uh, we saw a lot of class folks in there. Uh, people who have been involved with the Junction. Of course, we've seen um, some donors Thank you so much for being a part of this and for actually supporting and making this happen. Uh, you make a huge difference. Board members have been on here as well. Uh, we know you're very proud for what you support. Thank you so much for being there. Um, last thanks again also to Nancy Finton and especially Lavinia. Uh, we have to brag about her a little bit because she has really changed um, what Irish language is here um, in Minnesota, especially how it's being um, shared and spread and celebrated and enjoyed. And our dream, of course, is to have Irish soaking up the walls as much as we can. So thank you for making that happen, Lavinia. And we can find our last few words. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure we, we recognized everybody before we left. So Anishka was freed on um, Rod and um, and thank you for everybody who came and who listened to us tonight. Really and truly, sure, we wouldn't we'd be talking to amongst ourselves. Um, but thank you all very much for taking part. So Anish, Nancy, go ahead. Lie on fuckle zero knock. Lie on fuckle zero knock on each. Lie. Everyone for coming. Go to Mila Magi. Um, thanks to all my students for sticking with Irish over the years and becoming friends. And. Um, Thanks to you, Lavinia, for the things you've been doing for the language, to Fenton, to everybody, for making the connections that still keep me happy to be an Irish speaker in Minnesota. Well, Nishif Garamil and Agus and Nancy Gutsche, Agus Ta, almost all were in Gutsche or new, and Maris Tu Kyongan of Kyan Rodi Atan Shav, Minnesota, Agus Tigan was Eshin Gariwa, Fenton a store. Oh, I've said it all. I have nothing more to say. <laughs> Uh, I've run out of words. You've run out of words. We're all, we're coming to the end. Well, Gora Mila, Mila, Mila Mahagi and Natalie, thank you very much there for, for um, taking care of us all there this evening online um, and, and monitoring all the IT and everything and and with the Celtic Junction. And um, so, Mara Dershid, our Ska, Akela, Warrens, Nadini. So, um, Oh, wait a while, her come out. Any fader. Um So anyway, we'll all keep in this together and we work together as we go forward with the language and we'll do what Douglas Dehidza said. Is few I allowed to smile. Have you met Golarot? You're gone tanga. You're gone on. I'm actually to mess with us. Me can't let Golarot let his garot. I go a mile, mile, mile. My hagi lega harde and go good to the shabelig. Is um, she no will go for him? Ihuahagi. Ihuahagi.